Okay. Uh, um, this is the Staggering Stories podcast where I am Wilkie and we are interviewing Barnaby Edwards, Starlink Operator, Joseph Lister, Writer, Dan Starkey, Sontaran, <laughs> <laughs> Linda Clark, Blood Tide, Mother Blood Tide. And I'm also Scott from the Staggering Stories. <laughs> <laughs> Um, questions, right, uh, here we go. Um, <laughs> you, <laughs> how did I expectation from the audience? <laughs> <laughs> um, this, uh, how did you, a question for all of you first, how did you get into your particular profession? I mean, for you, the Dalek uh, suit. I know you're, I know that there's the big finish side of it. I'm wearing it right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, writing the, how did you get them? In your initially step forward in your acting professions or like ladies first? Oh right, okay. Sorry. <laughs> it's it's time to think. Yes, <laughs> um, thank you. <laughs> it's something that I wanted to do since I was sort of knee high. I knew that I, I wanted to be an actress, um, but then as you get older, life gets in the way yep. somewhat. Yeah. So um, after sort of getting married, getting divorced, having kids, <laughs> um, I finally sort of um, started doing some amateur stuff. So once my kids were more grown up in actual fact, somebody then said to me, have you ever thought about going professional? And I said, yes, in my wildest dreams. But then the seed was sown. So uh, I got together with a friend of mine who also wanted to become a professional. We formed a, a duo called Hokum and Harmony. <laughs> and we, we toured <laughs> sort of old people's homes and everything doing the, uh, the half century show. Uh, music, song and dance from 1900 to 1950. <laughs> I mean, that's a nice <laughs> little title. Yes. And, um, and we got, we got our, um, we got our record dance doing that and it then yep. sort of went so, on from there. Yeah. Yeah. So, which was brilliant. You know, I started off doing French stuff and then doing theatre tours and eventually some television. And so that's how I started. Uh, for me, I, well, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a scientist because I watched Doctor Who. And the obvious logical conclusion to that was like, I want to invent a time machine. I literally dream. <laughs> when, I <was laughs> when I was small, until I was about like, 13 or so, I was still to be a scientist. And then I started doing science in secondary school and lost it. It was significantly drier than all the kind of exciting books for science for children that I had devoured yeah. when I was a kid. And, but also, when I was a school student, I started, I started, started doing school plays. And it, I, I always enjoyed like, doing that sort of thing, but it kind of crept up on me that, oh, this, this is fun, and that seems to be quite good at it. But it, it still took a while, I did some uh, acting in university a bit as well, but then I still, um, it took me a few years in between university um, and having a normal job for a bit um, before I went to drama school proper and actually sort of uh, took, took the plunge and yeah. Thing, but I was always, I was always, I was always on temp contracts. I was never, I never quite committed to having a proper job. Yeah. So um, yeah, and then I did bits of stuff on the fringe in London, and then I sort of got to a certain level with that, and I sort of thought, right, I can't really go any further unless I've got some kind of professional training or some kind of platform. So I, yeah, I applied for the Bristol Vic um, on a very, very late. Yeah, I think it was after the deadline. I just put a, put a, put, a, put an application in. And then I got in, so it was quite a quite a yeah. thing. And then I suddenly sort of realised, oh right, so now I You're sort there. of have a career. <laughs> but that was that wasn't until I was twenty seven. And then so after after that, I like, did, did two years there, and then sort of like, luckily kept on working. And then Doctor Who was my first television job, and then it sort of uh, left off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, I wanted to be an actor. <laughs> yeah, so I did lots of acting. Um, I was in drama clubs. I did drama at school. I was then in. I was even in the Operatic Society, which was a bunch of old people. <laughs> and um, me and this girl. And, uh, yeah, this, I imagine our show's probably looked quite often. They did seven prizes. Seven prizes. <laughs> <laughs> and you basically a bunch of 80 year olds, and then these two 15 year olds dancing around. Um, and, but then I got to about 17, 18, and started to kind of lose confidence in yeah. being on the stage and stuff. Um, but also at the same time, the last big thing we did, uh, I did, was um, we did a school production of Amadeus. Um, which was an astonishing school production, yeah. school production but it was astonishing. I played Salieri yeah. and had a blast. It was the best thing I've ever done in my life. I enjoyed it so much. And it was while doing that I realised that the reason I was enjoying it so much was because the script was so good. Yeah. And it was giving us all as actors, as, you know, school children, but as <laughs> actors in the play, uh, it was giving us all really strong stuff to do. And I loved the darkness of it, the light, yeah. the humour, and everything. And it just, there was something in it that just made me go, oh, can I want to do that. I want yeah. to to write up with it. Yeah. Yeah, you sort of people there, but um, 
so yeah, I kind of, at the same time, did a media GCSE and was starting to see that you could analyse TV and film in the same way that I've been analysing books yeah. while doing English literature. Um, and it just all came together in my head of, actually, that's what I want to do. I want to make that's TV and my plays and things. Yeah, yeah. Well, so yeah, it was a real kind of, all just happened at the same time. And so I did media at university, and, uh, which, you know, is a pretty useless degree, frankly. <laughs> um, so I did media at university, then I left and did telly sales for a year. And then I left and worked as a British Smith for a year. And then I moved to Ireland and worked in car finance. Uh, but when I moved to Ireland, at the same time, I basically been applying for lots of things. I wasn't getting anywhere. Um, and I knew about Big Finish. I wasn't listening to the audios. I think I'd heard one, but I knew about them. Um, so I sent in an idea to them. Um, and they liked it, and yeah. it got made, and it's you know still bottom of the pile. <laughs> most people hate it. It's still one of, it's always comes in the bottom ten it, it most hated releases. So um, the rapture, yeah. I mean, yeah. It's not a bad story. <laughs> oh, it's you're always going. <laughs> Yeah, it's not too nice to go to a beach. It means you take over the world with dance music and jokes. It's left out. Is it? Is it? <laughs> but the thing was, I was not I wasn't listening to Big Finish. Didn't have a clue yeah. what the other audios were like. I didn't know what other people were doing. I'd read the New Adventures, and the yeah. New Adventures had been more like that. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and I'd always, I'd always thought that thing of Doctor Who being the Yeti on the Loo in Suiting Back. And, yeah. Well, I mean, I'd never been to Beaver, but I was going clubbing every weekend. And so, so I was just like, oh, Doctor Who in my world would be brilliant. Um, lots of people disagree. <laughs> <laughs> but luckily, I got commissioned for a second big finish before the first one came out, um, and that went down much better. And then, yeah, so I ended up doing more big finish, and then I just I got into Cardiff. I was staying at the Doctor Who website, uh, and got me next to Russell, and Russell you know, um, voided for free. And that led to everything else, and getting an agent and everything. Yeah. Oh, professional. Uh, I didn't know about you. You write. Uh, about to direct on your story, which is uh, yes. uh, rather fabulous. But you write really, really great dialogue, which an actor would love to say. So that I didn't know that's about your acting why, yeah. sort of thing. That's why, because your dialogue is so it flows off so beautifully, um, and you just think, oh, it's great. Right, I'm, I'm in happy hands here, rather than sort of some strange, weird, convoluted <laughs> techno battle that no one can actually physically say. Oh, yeah, um, no, I don't do science stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's not great when writing got two good. audios because it's yeah. like, yeah, it's just like well, you do need an explanation. Yeah. Use of sound. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I, uh, I did. I, my route is reasonably similar to uh, to Dan's in that I did lots of plays at school, and then I went to university and did a completely non. I, I did French and fine art at university, um, and then when I was there, I did lots of student theatre, and I did Edinburgh and things like that. And when I, I then spent a year in Paris as part of the degree. Uh, and I did some voiceover work when I was in Paris, um, and then I sort of got the bug for it. And then after university, I went to drama school for a year, and then just took off. And when I was at drama school, I was at drama school with I was at university as well with, with Nick Pegg, um, the other dialogue yeah. operator. And he knew Gary Russell, and then um, Gary Russell knew Kevin Davis, who was making Thirty Years in Natalie. So immediately I left drama school. Nick was asked to be cyber leader in the Thirty Years in Natalie. The next week they said we're having. Daleks, um, do you know anyone from drama school? Nick went, recommended me, and then for that, I went from that into doing Dalek operating, into doing big finish, and, and everything sort of fled, <coughs> fled from there. That wasn't me running up, that was me just choking. <laughs> 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 just no, choking on a bit of the case. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all well, first of the country was up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's, that's the route in. There are many routes in. Yeah, yeah, both of your particular parts. Um, for yourself, what do you prefer, the directing or, I don't know, uh, the acting side? I quite like the whole, yeah, I quite yeah. like the whole flitting between one of I've got a very <laughs> bad attention span, so I quite like, you know, the fact that one week I'll be writing and then I'll be script editing something or directing something or producing something or acting in it or preparing a, an unabridged audio book for Audible or whatever, so I like the variety of it. Yeah. And the good thing is that you know, there are very few steady jobs in yeah. acting. Um, so you do have to do lots of different things. I mean, Dan has his own sort of theatre company and everything as well. So we're all doing different things to keep going. So I like the variety. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> keep going for that one golden time. I find the cheese and keeps me going. I've done Dalek's more than John Scott Martin. Paying <laughs> <laughs> for that one. And he's dead, so you're already winning it. <laughs> I'll never have hell. <laughs> Dan, what exact question to you? What do you prefer? The directing? As you said you had your own production company. Well, it's a lot of production. Ideally, you have a few years. Ideally, you have a few years. I work with a, um, it's, 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 it's a group uh, of people um, 
so indirectly line up in drama school. It's yeah. called the Fitzrovia Radio Hour. And it's kind of like a, it's a theatre show. It's like a 1930s radio, subversion of a 1930s radio show on stage. So we're all in dinner suits with chrome like balls oh, and stuff like that, making sound effects. And sort of uh, lots of slightly oddly inappropriate kind of like, <laughs> yeah. lots of strange contemporary spins on sort of like 1930s pulp stories. So that's that sort of thing. But uh, that, that's sort of on the edges for a moment because we're all sort of like trying to sort of go in different directions, like possibly sort of doing our own original audio material. Yeah. All that sort of thing. But also, I've started doing a little bit of writing as well, so I've been writing for Big Finish as well. And again, I've come to that via yeah. being an actor and yeah. also knowing stuff about Doctor Who. And it's precisely what you're saying, so I'm writing. <laughs> Why was I having to say the dialogue that I've actually written? <laughs> I, I have no one to blame but myself <laughs> for this long and convoluted yeah. sentence. But, um, but then someone asked me, he said, well, do, you, uh, do you feel sort of very concerned when someone's reading your, the dialogue that you've written? I said, no, no, I feel relieved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I think, I think it is that case of, like, you know, when you're an actor, either you can sort of like go into a job, especially if you're filming or something, you'll sort of go into like film a film or television programme over three weeks, and then you go away, and it's not broadcast for another six months. <laughs> and they go, right, what, what do I do now? And yeah, you can either sit and twiddle your thumbs, or you can sort of like just have some agency and try and get some of this. So I think it's always the thing of trying to get your fingers in lots of pies yeah. and have lots of lines in the fire. Just try and be in control a bit more, because <laughs> otherwise it's absolutely, you know, things, things fall down from the sky or they don't. But, yeah. and and it's all the same it? stuff, it's, it's all creativity, whether you yeah. are writing or whether you're directing or whether you're making yeah. music or whatever, it's all some channel of, of creativity. Yeah. And if you can try and pay your rent doing it as well. That's yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yes. So Dan, have you managed to write a big finish yet? Yes, yeah, yeah, there will be a big finish later this month, September. September 2015, um, and it's called Terror of the Sontarans. <laughs> it's co-written with John Dorney. Um, so you've basically written yourself. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. You know, what you should have. <laughs> well, actually, that was a very specific way. Well, I think it wasn't necessarily. I did come up with one idea. There was like, no half half Sontarans in. Like, right. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So they might they might trust me to do one which hasn't got Sontarans in at some point in the future. But that was, that was definitely a sort of one. And, and also John Dorney was there. Who's, Written a lot of them and knows what he's doing, so he's very good at helping with the carpentry of it. And so we sort of divided the labour between ourselves. So it's, it's half him and half me. And by the so by the numerous drafts it's gone through, I think it's a fairly good mixture of us both. And yeah, and uh, we recorded it in January. So now I've just about forgotten what happened with it. So I can look forward to being surprised by it. <laughs> yeah. when I hear it You're going to have to buy it now. So, yeah. so I, 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 I think I might get said. I think that might be. <laughs> buy your own, was it? No. <laughs> Don't get any perks. <laughs> and Barnaby and Jack, what sort of freedom did you have with your pitches with Big Finish? Did you go over with your ideas or what monsters you'd like to use? Um, yeah, I mean, because I'm usually involved in the production, so I don't ever write anything that I don't direct, because I'm a complete megalomaniac. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, I, I'm usually involved at some stage. Certainly, I did lots of writing for the, for the Eighth Doctor and Lucy Miller adventures. And I was there with the concept, you know, this is the one we were going to... I, I think I suggested bringing back the meddling monk, and then they said, well, you can have that story and things like that to write. So, um, yeah, I, the, I know what I'm going to get. Um, or sometimes I'll say, we're going to write this story, eight. First story and second story, and you need to write the, the you know, something between them or something. So yeah, it's not really. It's quite open ended, I think. A big finish, isn't it? You bring them an idea, and then they'll um, they will say yes or go away and never bother me again. <laughs> but it was slightly different for me in that my first one was completely my own idea. I mean, and obviously we developed it and stuff like that. Um, and then after that, it was usually Gary Russell at the time um, would say. But can you do one where with the master in it and make him have an easy act? And then it was, can you do one with uh, Daleks and Davros and, and, you know, so give me the dots of the companion and use an element yeah. that he wanted in it. Um, I did one, the, the re thing, that was all I've been asked to do was put a side man in it. Yeah. So I, I decided for family stuff, which I did at home. And then, yeah, I think the gathering was the same. The only one actually I really had freedom on was, not freedom. Um, the other one I got nothing given other than the Lost Companion was 100. I did an episode of their 100 release. Um, but I, I, personally as a writer, I prefer it when I'm given something, yeah. a hook. And I find that with the TV stuff I do, <clears throat> I'm usually given just something. Even if I'm told, can you just focus on this character? Um, or can you do you know something like this? Um, I find that much easier, not easier, but definitely easier than just sit down and write something, yeah. you know, because I'm, like you were saying about creating your own stuff, I've just come out of doing a very intensive 
six months on the same three on three different kids TV shows juggling them. So I've written these three episodes, they're not going to be broadcast or whenever. And suddenly I'm like, oh, 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 oh. Don't know what you do. I, you, what do you do when you're not in the pub and not writing? It's like, what, 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 I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what to do. And so, yeah, then, now I'm trying to develop my own things as well. And, but it's, it's harder because you just sit there looking at the computer mm. screen going, yeah. what do you do? How do people come up with ideas? Because you get so used to being given an idea that you develop. Ah. Um, yeah, I don't really know how to come up with ideas anymore. And it's interesting as well, it's just that whole sort of thing of. Uh, being told when I was pitching my ideas to Vigna, it's being told what not to write, which in some ways mm. is quite useful. Mm. So there was yeah. ideas I came up which had a plot element in it, it's like it involving mirrors. It's like, no, a couple of episodes down that season, we're going to have some involving mirrors, so you can't do that. So like, okay, but it's, it's actually useful having a description put on it. Yeah. So, so sometimes. It's and then the good thing yeah. is, you save your mirrors idea to something else. Yes, absolutely. Yes. That's always the good thing. You get told you can't do it, you put it in your box. And, yes. yeah. Well, if you wanted an idea, Joe, for... <laughs> you know, the... For a one woman show. No, no, they had that return of the carry lights. Oh, that's yeah. it. Well, yeah. you see yeah. it's new Well, you can yeah. probably not finish. Yeah. Yes, I'll oh, finished doing new series yeah. Yeah. I've already written a synopsis. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm very happy to direct that. There we go. There we go. There the the Carrie Lines versus Strats on Tyrus. Yes. Yes. Written by Joseph Lister. Directed by Mark. Bought by Noah. Bought by Noah. As long as we get to do our parts again, so that'd be fine. How did you both try the prosthetic work? Because um, your, your, both your shows are actively made. Yeah, up. what sort of training did you get for that? You, you don't get training. training. <laughs> <laughs> That's a training for God's sake. It's a deep end. No, no, it's, 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 it's sitting there while sort of people um, wrap loads of sort of plaster of Paris bandages around you to get a shape of you know, to get the shape of your head. Turn you into a mummy. To turn you into a mummy. Yeah, right. um, so you know, around you. And you and, you know, and as you gradually sort of even, you know, your ears get covered up and you can't hear stuff and it's, it's really weird. But yeah, once that comes off they make the head and then you look at it and you say, Oh my god <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the weird thing is that you don't because it's actually it is your face, but it's your face going because <laughs> <laughs> you've got a lot of plaster on it, so it's going to work. Yes. But, but yeah, um, then, you know, and then the prosthetics are made, which, I mean, they're beautifully done. Um, but it's, you know, I mean, the main part of it is sort of rolled over your head like a balaclava. Yeah. And then all the rest of it is, is sort of um, stuck on and ears and eye bags and, and everything like that. It, it took over four hours to do the whole, the whole thing, you know, to put it all on. And, um, it, the only thing was, it was uh, we were filming in August, and it was pretty hot. Yes. It was yeah. pretty hot, and there was a, a little bit of a, a gap mm. underneath where the ears were. Yeah, and as you're sort of sweating underneath, you know, you pause, you sort of fall, <laughs> you, know, you sort of turn your head to speak, you just slop, 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 yeah, yeah. from side to side. But apart from that, and the things after what you you forget, yeah. you forget that you're wearing them. You know. And there was somebody I knew actually who was, who was one of the extras, so I just went up to him, you know, and said, "Hello." <laughs> 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 it was, sorry. Yeah. Oh yes, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> yes. It was funny because I also do Wizards vs. Aliens. Joe yeah. wrote, um, wrote for, it, and uh, they came with Randall Boone with his big nose. I, 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 saw, I saw Nick Briggs. So like back, uh, backstage at, uh, in Cardiff on the season of office. I bounded over and I'm going, hello! I'm <laughs> going, who the hell is that? <laughs> it's Dan. Oh right, so, yeah, I'm dressed as a hot goblin. So, uh, yeah. And so Stephen looked confused as he often does. His, his mental processes are sort of like a deeper involvement. So I'm like, there was, a, there was another... <laughs> it was kind of quite surprising. But uh, again, the, the Randall Boone's thing, where we, there's usually Randall Boone was inside. He was inside his chamber, this hot goblin. He had a very large nose. But when we did a little bit of location filming, the nose is large and hollow, and we were filming on That's quite right. cold. Yes, 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 yes. yes. It, was, it was a lovely yes. episode. And um, lovely form. But because it was fairly chilly when we were filming, and inside the mask is quite warm, the nose would fill with condensation. <laughs> and so there were lots of takes where I'd move my head and then this kind of stream of water <laughs> <laughs> straight out of his nostrils. So it's like that is constantly dripping nose. But actually it's just water. <laughs> it was just yeah, an extraordinary yeah, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just water. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 there, are, there are days when I've had a cold as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not be nice either, but sort of like, yes, yeah, glue and snot. Yeah, well, so I myself was funny on Wizards as Varg and Lexi, the two main aliens, 
absolutely gorgeous in real life. Yeah, they're both it's stunning because they're both about six foot two, isn't it? I mean, she's in Game of Thrones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. gorgeous. Oh, yeah, I was in love with her until I saw him in the bars. Yeah, and then they're both covered in all this makeup and stuff, so you can't tell who they are. It's such a shame. It's a waste. <laughs> Uh, we have something that we do on the podcast, which is uh, life pod discs. So you've got you've got a countdown. What do you want to take with you on luxury items, books, videos, or music? Uh, so it's like Desert Island Discs. Desert Island Discs, yes. yes. but you don't you don't do an in depth interview in each one, is there? <laughs> right. So you've got um, books, DVDs, music, and a luxury item. Okay, right. Like Should we just go down to doing one category? <laughs> yeah. A book. Okay, I'd love to take um, Carl Sagan's book, The Cosmos, because I had it when it first came out in the TV series, and I was obsessed with the book, and I absolutely adored it, and I loved watching the TV series. So I would take Carl Sagan's Cosmos. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Which I would take. No, I would take. I'd take Dot Who and the Junior Giant Robot, or whatever it's called. <laughs> um, uh, I would take. Um, uh, the complete work to act for Christine, so it's a bit of a cheat. But I love, yeah. I love her writing so much. I always forget which one I've read before, which is great. So I always, I'm, you know, I can get two thirds way through and I have read this one before, but I can't remember who did it. Um, but I just love her writing. It's so yeah. funny and witty and simple. It's yeah. deceptively simple. So I would take all her books in one book. I'm torn in between getting something that I know would nourish me for a very long time on a desert island. So like, I, I, I read Gravity's Rainbow a couple of years ago, and that was amazing. But it's the sort of book that you need an encyclopedia to actually appreciate. But it's amazing as a kind of as a kind of work of the, I don't know, don't know how uplifting it would be if I was stuck on a desert island. So I mean, actually, when I was doing a theatre show, I wasn't particularly enjoying. Like, I read, I got through the entirety of Middle March in about three weeks, and that was uh, that 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 so that, that was really good. And that's just uh, yeah. Middle so so March is good. Yeah, I, I see. Yeah, Middle March is good. I read I didn't have Sontar in Off the top of my head, uh, a, a book that I've, I've read a couple of three times and always, there's all these bits that always make me laugh out loud, and that's Spike Milligan, and I'll fit them in my part of his And you know, it's it's yeah. just one that I've gone back to from time to time, and, and it, it, you know, I mean, if you're stuck on your own, you're going to laugh. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I could revise that. There's a book, it's a Monty Python book, but it's called Bert Fegg's Nasty Book for Boys and Girls. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's quite a slight book, but it's, it's very amusing. <laughs> so what other categories have we got to go? Um, oh, right, so music, any, any music that... Um, oh, that's so hard, isn't it? Because there's so many <laughs> um, I, Are you had an album, or is it just a track? Anything. Album or track. Whatever, whatever throats your boat. <laughs> Let's start at the other end on this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, one, uh, again, I suppose one that I play most often, there's two actually. Um, yeah, um, Josh Groban, who I love, and uh, you know, it's basically it's just the best of. <laughs> and yeah, I, I, it just gets played again and again and again, because I absolutely love his voice, and I think I could just listen to it. Yeah. My mind's sort of going blank. I was, when I was asked this the other day, I thought, probably something by, something by PJ Harvey, because it wouldn't cheer me up. So I was on the desert island. I'm saying that I'm not on your yeah. line. <laughs> PJ Harvey, Gravity's Rainbow. Yeah. <laughs> it's the party oh, time. Oh, off again. Yeah. How are you on your island, Dan? <laughs> Fine. Not visiting. Just enjoy the vision. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, my joke. Yeah. Yeah. I love Adam Christie. Oh, okay. I've got okay. my yeah. own anymore. Yeah. 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 Well, did you choose it? Oh, I did. Yeah, I put yeah, mine to play. Django Reinhardt. I don't really, see, I don't really have like, specific bands there. I mean, I still like my dance music, there's a, and there's a, I'd probably take a trance music collection, yeah. um, because you get three hours of music. Uh, it's all one thing, there's no gaps. Uh, there's also, <laughs> yeah. it's very emotional, yeah. so there's also yeah. high bits, and I'm going sad, and all that. So I'd take the best of Euphoria. So yeah, I'm by art. What about you, Barney? Best of Euphoria? Can yes. we just yeah. 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 um, Either that or, or Pants People. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think I'd, I'd have to take something by Kate Bush. I think I'm uh, yeah. Kate Bush. I'd take I'd take the album Ariel, which is a, a relatively unknown native one, which is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, it's films as well. I don't know if you've oh, oh, the Seventh Seal. It's a really cheap. <laughs> 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 I think I'd 
take Tom Hanks's cast away. Oh yeah. 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 Oh, I don't know. There's so many fantastic films on that. I, don't know. I, take, I mean, I think a little perfect, utterly perfect film is Lifeboat. Hitchcock's Lifeboat. I think that's just a brilliant film. So I, I take that. I'd take a special recommissioned box set. Um, no, we have two films in it. We have uh, A Match of Life and Death, um, one which is Glory Film, and Speed, which I think is <laughs> genuinely, it's, it's genuinely one of the best. It's, it's like a modern day Hitchcock. I can, it's because it's so well made. The characters, the scripts, and the characters, every character on that bus is a character. It's gorgeous. And I get so disappointed when I watch supposedly Hollywood action films that aren't as good as that. I'd love to see um, Palm Pressburger's speed. Speed. Oh, <laughs> yeah. David Niven. Yeah. 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 Like Blazing Saddles or the producers or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that would cheer me up. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so you're a reading matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not actually that gloomy. That's the first thing I've ever done. If anything is to look at you, I'm just going to be a hangman. <laughs> <laughs> That's tell take two. <laughs> Intelligence. <laughs> if, it, if, it, if it's box sets, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. it'll have to be the Godfather. Oh, oh, yeah, yes. To my shame, I've never seen them. Oh. Well, uh, well, yeah. I mean, hold up. Yeah, going, uh, going way back, Casablanca. Because I'm oh, yeah, that's the wittiest that's film, you know, scripts yeah. and everything. Yeah. But yeah, but I, I probably have to walk the box set because there'd be more. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I think that often is a luxury item. Um, whatever. It is chocolate. <laughs> no, I think I'd probably take uh, art equipment, it's yeah. tough to paint with. Yeah. <laughs> right, thank you. <laughs> what goes with your trance music? Narrow it down. Yeah. <laughs> I, I take heroin. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Please no one report that in your children's television writer. Your job isn't recorded. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I thought this was a dream. Yeah. Um, I'd probably take wine. I'd probably yeah. take some really nice red wine yeah. because oh, then, then the island would be lovely. I'd just sit there sipping wine, listen to my music, watching the film. I want to go there. This is a holiday. Yeah, this is the best moment ever. Unlike um, <laughs> the next island in the bay. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> a burnished like piece it. of irregular memory. <laughs> <laughs> Slowly I can file in the shape of a mirror to see my mortality. <laughs> um, no, perhaps, perhaps some paper, and if it's like paper and pencils. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I could draw or I could write and that sort of thing. I like that all my guitar, that's all I Yeah. Yeah, I was going to go for paper and pencils and a pencil sharpener, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Like radio, won't it? <laughs> <laughs> I was attempting to give it ritual suicide. Paper. <laughs> I'd like to ask Barnaby who's the best Dalek operator. Ooh. John Scott Martin. <laughs> <laughs> How did his head fit in it? Well, that's why they had to have the dome delivered. <laughs> <laughs> I like the idea that the dome was some kind of hair dryer. <laughs> <laughs> he went in with completely flat hair yeah, and then he came <laughs> out with the <laughs> big bushy hair. <laughs> um, yeah, no, John Scott Martin is the granddaddy of us all. Um, uh, and yes, if I, if I can last another few years, maybe I will uh, <laughs> honour his legend by trouncing him and defeating him. <laughs> <laughs> I have no preference. I'm not going to all of the same. <laughs> right, that's you out of my address book. <laughs> Did you ever get into little arguments with the other Dalek operators? No, they know I'm boss. <laughs> Unless Daddy is on the stage. If Davros is there, then obviously you know we have to count out to Daddy. But um, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I mean, yeah, Nick Peg and I have done it for 21 years now. 
um, uh, when we first started, uh, although the show's only going for eleven years, we did it first in thirty years in the TARDIS. So okay. um, yeah, we've been the official operators for twenty-one years, but yeah, eleven years on screen. Did you volunteer, or were there certain qualifications you had? Uh, well, he actually offered me, uh, yes, yeah, smallness, but doesn't, that doesn't really work. Nick, Nick is six foot three. Um, and for those of you listening, so am I. <laughs> my beautiful flowing head of hair. Um, uh, yeah, no, we, we, we were both at drama school together and we just, just sort of fell into it, really. Um, and then when they brought the new series back, um, I was working with Big Finisher a lot, and the BBC used to sometimes phone me and say, did you have Bernard Cribbin and something? And I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he was, he was great to work with and stuff like that. And I kept getting this phone call from the BBC, and I, and I was busy doing something, and I kept hanging up and not answering it. And eventually, after about three days, it was the second assistant director on, on uh, Dalek who phoned up and said, we're trying to get through to you for about three days. Would you be interested in possibly doing the Dalek on television? Um, and about 14.8 nanoseconds <laughs> later, I said yes. Um, and then I was just whisked straight to Cardiff to do it. And then I brought Nick on board to the name he did I thought to be that successful that I'd ignore phone calls from the BBC. <laughs> yeah. Oh, not them again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, things have changed. Uh, yeah. I phoned them. Yeah. 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 Did you the dogs? Yeah. 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 Even we had a terrible year when they weren't doing dogs. Yeah. That was awful for you, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Stephen, I think, is, is um, he's so funny when you see him on, on set, Stephen Potter, because he, he, he has this permanently brilliantly slightly bemused look. Yeah. As if somehow this none of this is his creation. Yeah. <laughs> we did a, a big Dalek story which should be in the next season. And I just remember it was massive sets, monumental sets with, with large pieces of it sort of falling away and crumbling. He's like, I see him just sort of nodding there. Like, yeah. <laughs> what have they done here? And you think, you've written it all. <laughs> and it says, you know, Gerda snaps off and falls down. And he's like, you wrote that. Do you not remember? <laughs> I would say sometimes the wife would get, you know, I'll write something in the script and and then they will be, then suddenly it's the, um, oh, what do you call a meeting, where all the heads of the oh, time meeting. Time yeah. meeting. Suddenly it's a time meeting again. Right, so we've found a location where we can have the roof cave in. And you'll go, oh, that's, because uh, you always wait for the, the draft where someone goes, oh, yes, no, we have to take that out now. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you always wait for that. And then suddenly you're in a time meeting where they're going, you know, oh, yes, no, we've done that, and we've done that. And you go, oh, my God. That's, yeah, that's because of uh, one of the things I've written. Petty Feather is um, recorded at this amazing old school called Cobham Hall, um, not far out of London. In the amazing ground. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the International Station, right? Um, which doesn't have shopping, which is very annoying. But um, <laughs> it was only because it's only Cobham Hall. I went on set on Tuesday. And I was, I took some pictures, which I'll show the microphone now. Um, <laughs> oh, because it, you know, you're sitting there watching, watch looking at this amazing old something century house with all these actors and extras in costumes and the cameras and everything. And it's a kids' show, so it's not a big thing. But I did just stand up and I go, I'll never get used to the fact that most people are in because of some crap I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, yeah. because in, you know, I spent March to July in my pants at home on my laptop <laughs> with a flag in my pocket. Yeah, no, no, no. And now all these people are here making this beautiful costume drama. It's the um, bizarre thing in the world. Is it, is it my back? Because I saw it. Um... Hetty Better? Yeah. Yes. Yes, because I'm on series two. Series one's on at the moment. Heard it here first. Yeah. Well, no, I said it the other one. I heard it here second. <laughs> I know we've only got a couple of minutes left, so is there any questions yet? Yeah, you've had your hand up for a while. Um, so, Joe, actually, um, about shadows. Um, how did you get into it? Uh, my. Oops, sorry. Um, um, uh, will there be any things in the 50th anniversary of the next year? I got into it, my flatmate at the time, Stuart Manning, was a fan of it, probably the only British fan of this show that no one else had heard of. And he convinced Big Finish to do it, and you know, I always support, I think nobody does, you know, you support your friends and stuff, so I was listening to his stuff, not really getting it, watched some of the series, didn't really get it, and then one night we came back from the pub and I went, look, I really want to like Dark Shadows. Find a bit in it, and he found there's a storyline that starts halfway through it where the vampire goes back to 1897 yeah. uh, to find out why he goes to dishonor the house. And that first episode of that is just brilliant. Oh, and uh, It's brilliant. And after that, I was gripped. 1897 is a 
yeah. just glorious. Every character is bonkers. Every actor is giving amazing performances. It's beautiful. It's just hysterical and scary and all out there. It's crazy. Uh, so that got me into it, uh, and then I got into the audios when Stuart started to start to leave and went into the audios. Will there be anything for the 50th anniversary? I really hope so. Um, we've nearly finished the batches out at the moment. Blood Dust was a huge success, our mini-series, uh, Murder Mystery Supernatural mini-series was a huge success, so we're hoping there's more, um, there's some discussions going on behind the scenes at the moment, but I've chosen writers and know exactly what we want to do. And who's my favourite character? Mm. Matthew Waterhouse. Uh, Matthew Waterhouse. Yes. <laughs> it would be John Cunningham from the Beeping Bob. Yeah. Right. Anyway, Matthew Waterhouse. No, uh, for the TV series, it would probably have to stick. The obvious answer is Julia Hoffman, because um, she is, Grace and Paul is possibly the campest thing that has ever been on television. <laughs> and she is amazing, and her performances are stunning, and, and you just hear stories about how when people try to block her eye line, she went and stood on his foot for an entire scene. <laughs> and at the end of it, and of course she's still alive, and at the end of it she went, you'll never do that again, will you? Uh, <laughs> only her voice is a lot deeper than mine, so it's like, you'll never do that again, will you? But, um, yeah, so you won't be there. I think Matthew Waterhouse has come to kick us out. It's <laughs> <laughs> just knowledge to make sure you mention his character. Yeah, we did. <laughs> we, did, we, did we did mention it. Yes, five uh, did you mention, mention the uh, award-winning the, the, the no, fabulous Big the Dark Shadows Bloodlust. Yes, and we the, 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 the it. Best <laughs> Actor <laughs> Award. I don't know who got it, but yeah, it must I, be pretty amazing. I think he's kind of wanted to come back, so you, you, you better find a script for him. Yeah, yeah. I think he's. We'll see. Just let him come back. We'll go out the back. Oh, all of you. Um, was there any show growing up that you really wanted to be a part of and you're not allowed to say Doctor Who? <laughs> <laughs> right, so any show that we watched when we were growing up we really wanted to be a part of but not Doctor Who. Blake Seven. Okay. <laughs> yes. uh, there was an awful show called The Interceptor that ran for a year. I always wanted to be chased by The Interceptor while Annabelle Croft was going. Can you see any trees? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, so probably the interceptor or nightmare. Nightmare was amazing. Oh yeah, nightmare. Yeah, 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 we applied to go on that, and I don't think we got it because we went. They said, "Why do you think we do well?" And we went, "We spend less time describing the rooms." <laughs> 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 I got into the Avengers actually when it was repeated in the mid nineties when I was in sixth form, and then I shot Diana Rigg in the Crimson Horror. So uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 If I'd have been young enough, Grange Hill. <laughs> <laughs> How about you? Um, and you're not allowed to say Doctor Who. <laughs> or talk yeah. to the Jerry James. You'd like to be around the moon, wouldn't you? I think the part's up for, you know. <laughs> when you'll be knowing something, I will not be. <laughs> How are you with a nose? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, writing Randall's style was a joy. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was that the one thing. No, just, basically, I just got Derek to rewrite it. I just went, I'm still, and obviously, it's a true story about you. I, I was just standing again. I can't write his dialogue, I don't understand it. And he's like, well, it's the present participle. Well, no, 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 if that they ever book, do a yeah, by that book, shit, yes. Oh, sorry, Adric's back. Yeah, and I was just to say, if they ever do a 21st century CGI version of Camberwick Green, I would love to do that. <laughs> I can see you as Mrs. Honeyman. You'd be perfect. Thank you. Time to ask you. Yeah, Dr. Mock. Yeah, he had an amazing heart. Uh, yeah, and she's yes, in Yorkshire. <laughs> It's kind of broken down. We'll become cannibals any minute now. Society is broken down. Yeah, it's a yeah. 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 We'll be on our lovely desert island together. Yeah. And we'll be on his hideous. Andrew, it's a bit of a show. Thank you. Thank you very much.